marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Fi alfain wa sitash, taraka Donald Trump, nataha el sahab el mamluka lahu, fi New York, wa iktanasa tarshik el hizb al jabhuri, wa faza bil riyasa. Inuhu leysa muhafadhan taklidiyan, fa fi hain anhu yu ayid hafad el daraib, Wallahad min el dawabit, fa inuhu yu arid el tijara el hura, wa atra al el rusia, wa rafada khitat el pentagon, le beka kuat fi suria, wa hua laysa siasian taklidian kadelek, fa hua la yaksha an yu hajim eya shaks, yak talif mahu, fi el rai, o yuajah elehi in takadat. Sewa ken min al sahafiyin, o al ru'asa al sharikat, o al shaksiyat al riadiyya al ma'arufa. Ba'd al marikiyun yakbubuhu, wa ba'dahum la. Wa lakin hunak majmua min al jumhuriyin il adhina aaraduhu mudhu al baddeya bi'atabaruhu muhafadhan za'afan, wa laysa jumhuriyan hakikiyan. Wa hum yasimun al rafidun li Trump. Lamunakasha Amr Donald Trump, well Sara El Dair, Ala Ruch El Haraka El Merikia El Muhafada, Ya Surni Anurahib, Bewahid Min Akthar El Mufakirin, Ikhtaraman, Wahua El Katib, Walmu Arach, Walmu Alak El Elami, Max Boot. Welcome back to Dakal Washington. Well, there are Republicans and Democrats, people who like Trump, people who don't like Trump, but there are some people who didn't like President Trump way before he was President Trump. And one of the intellectual leaders of the Never Trump crowd is with us today, my friend Max Boot. Max, thanks for very much for joining us on Dachau, Washington. Thanks for having me. So, Max, who or what is a Never Trumper? Well, a Never Trumper, by definition, is somebody who doesn't think that Donald Trump should be president. And I was a Never Trumper from day one, even though I was a lifelong Republican. I never voted for a Democrat before my vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016. But the second that Donald Trump started running for president, I had an automatic and visceral aversion to him when he came down the escalator at Trump Tower denouncing Mexicans as rapists and murderers. I mean, I thought this is not the kind of thing that you could possibly do in American politics. It's certainly not the kind of thing that you should do. And then a few, year, a few weeks later, he attacked my friend uh, John McCain, one of the people I most revered in the world, saying that he wasn't a real hero because he was captured. Again, something you should not be doing if you avoided the Vietnam draft. You should not be attacking one of our greatest war heroes who spent five and a half years being tortured in captivity. And then, you know, uh, later that year, he called for a full and complete shutdown of all Muslims coming into the United States. Another thing that I don't think that any American political figure should advocate. So it was one outrage after another. I could not believe uh, what he was saying. I did not think that he deserved to win a single vote. Uh, and I opposed him from the start, and I oppose him today. And frankly, I think looking at his conduct in office over two plus years, he has vindicated pretty much everything uh, that those of us who were never Trumpers from the beginning were saying about him. So just to be precise, is the core critique that he is unfit, that he has committed illegal acts, or that you don't like his policies, or all of the above? I, I would say all of the above. I mean, I think the the core critique really is goes beyond the policy level, although I've always been appalled by his policies, which are essentially isolationist and protectionist, and he is really uh, stands in, in contradiction to more than 70 years of bipartisan American foreign policy. But my objection to him has always been much deeper than that. It's not that I disagree with him on issue X or Y, because there are a few issues where I agree with him. The real uh, critique is that he is utterly unfit morally and intellectually to be president of the United States. And part of that unfitness is that, uh, you know, he has, uh, I believe, broken the law. He has obstructed justice. Uh, he has misused the presidency for his own personal gain. But fundamentally, he has shown he does not have the, the, the character and, and uh, aptitude to be president in a responsible way and very different from any other president we've had in our history. So what do you say? to the millions of Americans who themselves played by the electoral rules, 
voted for a candidate who spoke to whatever concerns that they had, and then got him elected according to the system of government that we have in the United States. Were they crazy? Were they dupes? Were they blind to what you saw? I think that Donald Trump uh, showed that he is uh, a very good salesman, uh, or put another way, he's a very effective con artist. Uh, he has no real qualifications to be president. He doesn't understand policy. He doesn't understand history. He doesn't understand economics, but he understands how to sell himself to people. And he became kind of this empty vessel into which people poured their hopes and frustrations. He told people, I alone can fix it. He promised to transform everything from the deindustrialization of the American economy to the influx of undocumented immigrants and many other grievances that people had. And so people, there was, I think, a general sense of frustration in the country. Many people felt that the political system was not responsive. And I think a common trope among Trump followers was, you know, we need somebody to blow it up, to drain the swamp. I mean, they used various metaphors, but the basic idea was that he would become an agent of change. And I would hope that those who supported him would look at the record of the past two and a half years and understand, no, that he is not actually draining the swamp in Washington. He is filling it up with, with he's turning it into a cesspool. He is misusing his office. He is embarrassing America. He is humiliating uh, the people who voted for him. And he is not delivering on their promises, that, uh, on the promises that he made. I mean, you just had a, another General Motors plant closing down in Ohio, a state that he won by claiming that he would reverse uh, the, the trend of deindustrialization and, and the shuttering of, of large factories. He's not doing it. Uh, he is not delivering. He is, you know, he promised, you know, he said that he would make great deals. He's not making great deals. Uh, he, you know, the negotiations with North Korea just blew up. He doesn't even have a Middle East peace plan. So, uh, you know, he is, what he's really good at is, uh, is getting attention for himself, talking up a blue streak, uh, and uh, connecting uh, with, you know, about 30 percent of the U.S. population that, that feels very aggrieved by the trends of the last several decades. So he's been effective at that, but he has not been an effective president. So let's talk about the Republican Party for a minute. Um, this is a great old party, grand old party, uh, the party of Lincoln. Um, it used to be the party of Lincoln. What happened in the party in 2016 that that, that began with this tableau of 13 or so candidates, most of whom representing traditional Republican views of various hues and shades, and ending with a very untraditional victor. How did the party get captured, not just the electorate, but how did the party get captured by Donald Trump? Well, I write about this in my book, The Corrosion of Conservatism. I think this is actually decades in the making that Donald Trump uh, is more a symptom of what's been going on at the Republican Party than the cause of the illness, but he has certainly accelerated the malady. Uh, I think it really goes back, I mean, you can, you can trace it back to, to various points. I mean, I think the Republican Party really became the party of uh, Southern segregationists beginning in 1964 uh, and, 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 you know, kind of uh, dog whistled uh, to some pretty disreputable elements in American life. Uh, at election time, but with Donald Trump, it's it's really become a wolf whistle. I think the changes in the Republican Party accelerated in the 1990s. A whole bunch of things that happened, including the rise of Newt Gingrich and the bomb throwers in Congress who didn't play by the old rules, the uh, the rise of Fox News, which began in in, in 1996, uh, which I used to think was a relatively benign development, but. In hindsight, they weren't really pushing a conservative agenda of the kind that I held. They were really put it, pushing a populist, nationalist agenda. Then you had uh, the rise of Sarah Palin. That was something that uh, John McCain was responsible for and that he came to regret. You had the Tea Party. So what's happened over the course of the last several decades is that the Republican Party has become increasingly right-wing, increasingly shrill, uh, increasingly uh, based on anger. Uh, uh, increasingly uninterested in compromise, in, 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 indeed uninterested in anything, getting anything done other than vilifying the opposition, uh, and you know, increasingly hostile to, to immigration, and I think increasingly uh, racist, as you saw uh, with the way that many Republicans tried to delegitimize President Obama, of course, including Donald Trump with his crazy birtherism 
conspiracy theories. So I think all of that kind of prepared the ground for Donald Trump, and that's why Donald Trump, who I think has transgressed almost every norm of American politics and almost every norm of human decency, nevertheless maintains the support of something like 80 to 90 percent of Republicans. And I'm not one of those because the day after the 2016 election, I re-registered as an independent because I can't uh, stand being part of this Trumpified Republican Party. So e even though the, the, the two previous Republican candidates were very mainstream Republicans, uh, Mitt Romney, John McCain, uh, the way you look at it, they were more last gasp uh, reflections of a party that, that had shifted beneath them. I think that's right. And I think there was a sense that uh, Republicans did not really like or, or, or at least not love John McCain and Mitt Romney. I mean, it's really striking because whatever you may say about McCain and Romney, they're good people, okay? They are people who have lived exemplary lives. Uh, and they're the kind of people I would want to see in, in the Oval Office to represent America. But Republicans were really unenthusiastic about them. They thought that they were too squishy, too moderate, sellouts, not hardcore enough, whereas Donald Trump really gets the Republican juices flowing. And that, to me, is a damning indictment of the Republican Party, because whatever you may say about Donald Trump, even if you like him on the policy, I would hope that even most of the people who support him would admit that he is not exactly a great role model. They would not want their kids to be like Donald Trump. Um, when you look at the party today, has Trumpism, whatever that means, seat down way below Donald Trump? Do you think that the party itself reflects those negative uh, ideas and trends that, that you've just described? Yeah, I think it's absolutely the case that Donald Trump has taken over the Republican Party lock, stock, and barrel. I mean, John Boehner, who was a previous House Speaker who was a Republican, had a comment about a year ago where he said that the real Republican Party is taking a nap somewhere. Uh, and, and the way it, it's, it's looking right now, it's going to be a, a very long uh, nap. It's, it's going to be the big sleep the way we're going uh, because Donald Trump has made the Republican Party do these mental pirouettes uh, to change their positions on a whole bunch of issues. I mean, it's, it's uh, striking to see that the Re party, which used to be the party of traditional values, is embracing somebody who paid off his porn star mistress a party that used to stand for law and order is, a, is embracing somebody who almost daily vilifies the FBI and the Justice Department. The party that used to be the party of fiscal responsibility embraces a president who has added $2 trillion in debt since he came into office. A party that used to stand for free trade embraces a president who has launched trade wars with all of America's major trade partners. And just on and on and on, on issue after issue, Republicans have changed their thinking because there are very few principles they hold anymore. The only one that they really seem to be true to is whatever their supreme leader wants is what the supreme leader will get. Okay, when we come back after the break, more with leading light of the Never Trumper movement, Max Boot. Our guest today is Max Boot. Max is an historian, author, media commentator, and foreign policy analyst. He's the Gene Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow in National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, a columnist for the Washington Post, and a global affairs analyst for CNN. Born in Moscow, raised in Los Angeles, educated at Berkeley and Yale, Max is most recently the author of The Corrosion of Conservatism, why I left the right. Um, Max, let me ask you about uh, 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 public servants in the Trump era. Uh, what do you say to uh, millions of uh, civic-minded Americans who want to serve their country, uh, whether they like Donald Trump or don't like Donald Trump? They have a role to do, a job to do. Perf these perform jobs must be filled by well-meaning people. Should they continue to serve in the Trump administration? I would encourage people to serve as long as they're actually serving the country and not just serving Donald Trump or serving their own egos. I think there's a real danger there and I think you have to be clear about what you're doing because if you're going to be an enabler for Donald Trump, that is not your job as a, as a public servant. You are there, you swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and I, you know, I think a lot of senior Trump officials have actually taken that pretty seriously, folks like H.R. McMaster and Jim Mattis and others which, by the way, is part of the reason why they're no longer in office. Uh, so 
I would, I would hope that people would continue to serve and, and would, but I, you know, I, they have to view their job not as enabling the president, but as being a check and balance on the president to prevent him from doing more damage uh, than he's already done. And, and you've heard uh, people who have left the administration uh, say that they prevented Trump from doing things that were far more outrageous and crazy than what he has done, including on many occasions uh, when he asked them to do things that would be illegal. And, and mercifully, his, his aides have generally said no. And so I think that's actually a tribute uh, to the American form of government. Even though we have some, a, a demagogue in office who should never have been there in the first place, we do have checks and balances. And a lot of those checks come from within the executive branch, from uh, uh, dedicated civil servants, also from the media, from the Congress, from the courts. So, you know, although uh, uh, Trump uh, may seek to undermine our democracy, he is limited in what he can do because we have a very robust constitutional republic. As someone who I assume wants to bring uh, as swift an end to uh, the Trump presidency as possible, is it your pref what's your preference? Uh, election defeat? in 2020 or impeachment? Well, I think impeachment has to wait for the Mueller report to see what, what special counsel Mueller comes up with. I mean, I think there is ample grounds to uh, investigate whether uh, President Trump should be impeached. And I think that is something that House Democrats should do because uh, if you just read all the uh, news articles, I think they give you ample uh, uh, grounds for thinking that he should be impeached for things like uh, obstruction of justice, and, and misusing his office uh, to, you know, punish uh, his perceived political enemies and to reward his friends. Uh, I think he has been guilty of outrageous misconduct. But, you know, as a practical matter, the only while you, it's possible certainly to get a resolution of impeachment through the House to remove him, you need 67 votes in the Senate, and there just are not going to be 67 votes. And I think that the uh, Democratic leadership is very cognizant of how an attempt to impeach Bill Clinton blew up in the faces of Republicans in the 1990s, and they want to be careful not to repeat uh, those mistakes. And I think they're right in that regard, that they need to go slowly and build a consensus, and they should not really advance impeachment unless there is a chance that you will have a significant number of Republicans supporting it, which unfortunately at this, at this point you won't. When you look at uh, our politics, and you look not just at the Republicans, who we just described and discussed, but now you look at the Democrats. Um, how are they um, organizing themselves? Um, do you think that they are well prepared to take on Donald Trump in 2020? Are they on the right place in the political map, in your view? Well, I think the Democrats did a very smart and good job in, in uh, 2018 and picked up 40 House seats. I think they ran a very smart and focused campaign. But the question remains whether they will do as good of a job in in 2020. And my fear with the Democrats is that as you see the Republicans moving further to the right, I think you see a lot of Democrats moving, moving further to the left. And, and you feel, I, I sort of feels to me like the energy in the Democratic Party is coming from people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, people who are pretty far uh, to the left of the American political spectrum. And, you know, for somebody like me who is in the center right, I really feel homeless. I don't think there's any party that really speaks to the centrists and, and, and moderates out there. And I think there's an opportunity for the Democrats to do that if they nominate somebody who's pretty centrist and mainstream, like a Joe Biden or a Higginlooper or somebody else like that. Uh, but if they, you know, rush to the left, I think that they will create an opening for Donald Trump to get reelected. And between uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, and Donald Trump, where does Max Boot find himself? I mean, I would vote for Donald Duck over Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, I, I just think that Trump is uniquely unfit to be president. So I would vote for anybody, but I would strongly prefer that, that the Democratic candidate not be somebody like Bernie Sanders because I don't, I don't really support a Bernie Sanders, and I don't think most of the country will support him either. So one of the reasons that I have uh, a great respect for you is that uh, you have a, a deep appreciation for history, and you bring history to bear on our understanding of the president. present. Not that... Uh, the present is uh, defined by history, but that it helps inform history. So when you look at American history, is there a, um, a prologue moment for where we are today? I don't think there's any real parallel to uh, Donald Trump in American history. I mean, some people have tried to draw parallels with Andrew Jackson, but, you know, Andrew Jackson was a uh, successful general. 
you know, he, he had much more of a background in, in public life than, than Donald Trump has had. There, I, I think there really is no parallel in American history. Thank you so much for joining us on Dachau, Washington. Thank you. Yeah, this National Governors Association, and I'm kind of in a unique position where I served uh, 12 years in Congress as a member of the House, and seeing how the states have their own issues that come up, and we were talking whether it be their National Guard or how we do uh, transportation funding, and one of the ways we do it is speak more with a unified voice. Here a week or so ago, uh, I testified in front of my old committee on transportation about the needs for a federal transportation package, making the case with those relationships of folks that I have there, and then bringing the state's perspective. And it's, it's a powerful voice in that we're, we're almost evenly split, Democrat and Republican, amongst the state governors, uh, but yet we have a pretty unified voice on some of these issues of, of state's use of their National Guard and transportation. The time-honored joke about American politics, made famous by Will Rogers, the great humorist and social commentator, was his line, I am not a member of any organized political party, I'm a Democrat. The Democratic Party was, for decades, the party fighting with itself over race, ethnicity, taxes and spending, and foreign policy. With a low point being the riots at the Democratic National Convention in 1968. By contrast, Republicans always had the reputation for being orderly, organized, disciplined, and even a little boring. In election after election, Republicans nominated the next in line, always preferring the establishment candidate over the maverick. Of course, there is exaggeration and hyperbole in these caricatures of the two parties. The unruliness of 1968 was not always the norm for the Democrats. Roosevelt had a firm grip on the party in the 30s and early 40s. Party elders wisely chose young bucks in John Kennedy and Bill Clinton to challenge established politicians. On the other side of the aisle, Republicans have not always been so orderly and disciplined. The fight in the party between Goldwater and Rockefeller in the early 60s and between Reagan and Ford in the 70s was deep and real, reflecting profound differences of ideas, not just personalities. Our next election will show where the current moment fits in this historical spectrum. Democrats are poised for their noisiest, most freewheeling nomination fight in history with more than 20 candidates already announced and more to be expected. On the other hand, barring impeachment or some other legal or physical barrier, Donald Trump is already virtually anointed the Republican nominee for a second term. After his razor-thin victory in 2016, the question then becomes whether the experience of his first four-year term in office has convinced additional voters that he deserves another four years, or whether the marginal voter has had enough with Trump and looks elsewhere. That decision, in turn, will have huge impact on the future of the American conservative movement, whether it returns to its traditional themes of personal liberty and small government at home, defense of freedom and muscular foreign policy abroad, or whether it carries on the unique brand of Trumpist conservatism under a different standard bearer. There is, of course, only one Donald Trump. Will Trumpism survive him? Only time will tell. Bahava Nasilu al Nehed Halihil Halkam in Baranamaj, Dakhil, Washington. In the Kenneth Ladekum, Eya Istaf Sarat, O Ta'ali Kat, Haul Halihil Halka. While Kasatan, Haul Mustakbal El Haraka El Amerikia El Muhafada. Arjuan Tatawasilumai Aber Twitter Ala Hashtag Inside Washington. O Antarasiluni Muba Sharatan Ala at Rob Satloff. Sarakum El Sbo El Mukbil Wa Ila An Al Kakum Shukla Lakum Wa Ila Lakah.